Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Neon Salon. Today, I am joined by Jake Lifton Slater, who has a number of book series he's going to talk to us about, another great Vegas writer. Uh, Jay, thanks for being here with me. Thank you so much for having me on the Neon Salon. I really appreciate it. Let me do this if I can. I am Jay Clifton Slater, and I write military adventure, both future and ancient. Awesome. Perfect. It's a great tagline. Um, so before we get into that uh, military fiction, um, let's kind of start with your uh, writing background, um, how you came to it, uh, and what brought you to writing in the first place. I had never considered myself a writer. Um, yet, I worked in advertising for 30 years. And a friend of mine pointed out, there was a quote from Jimmy Buffett, and they said, how could you write books when he, you know, started writing books and became popular? And they said, how can you do it? And he said, I've written books my whole life, but they were three minutes long. The songs, right? I've written stories, but they were one minute long when I was writing commercials for clients. So I've written hundreds of one minute stories. I couldn't imagine retiring. I couldn't imagine never working again or, you know, going fishing or whatever. And it's an odd thing. It's just, there's this hobby called indie writing. You can go, if you take up working on cars, it costs you money. If you take up knitting, it costs you money. Fishing, it costs, any hobby you can name costs you money. Well, if you work it right, a hobby of writing can earn you back money. I got lucky. I wrote my first book. I put my own covers on it, didn't spend any money, put it up on Amazon just to see what would happen. No editing. <laughs> oh, no. It's horrible. Um, covers that were atrocious, but I used their cover creator. I took my own pictures, inserted it in there. And all of a sudden, I had a book up on Amazon, and Amazon started sending me checks. I said, well, let me do another book. My second book, I did that one. They sent me enough money. I started putting new covers on the books. Now I have books with nice covers. It's a hobby that turned into a full-time job for me. So you write full-time now, it sounds like. I full-time. And, I, and it's not only that. I took the drive I used that made me success in the corporate world, and I applied it to what I'm doing now. And um, it's producing pretty well. But I work long hours. I, I must admit right now I'm pretty well exhausted from finishing the last book which I finished yesterday. It's not a job for the faint of heart. Sometimes really? your brain is throbbing and your body and your back aches from sitting in your fingers and you just want to walk away from it and go, let me go outside. But you know, if you walk away from it at that point, the best stuff won't happen. And, and that's what we do. Can I ask what book it was that you finished yesterday? I finished a book, it's called uh, Uncertain Honor. It's book number 16 in the Clay Warrior story series. All of my books, even my fiction and my historical adventure, I call it, um, are, are, they use the same formula. And a formula is this, there's a major story going on, something happening around the character. And then within that is the character's story. Uh, for the historical adventure series, of course, it's the first Punic War. It's Rome against Carthage. And, and, at the time, Rome was a republic. Rome was only part of the, uh, from Tuscany down to the toe of the Italian peninsula. I have trouble with that word. Um, but that was all Rome was, whereas Carthage was an empire with trading posts and partners and warships and a fleet and navies and armies and just massive in, in Rome. They started clashing over to Sicily. And, and that's where the Freeze Punic War started. So that was that. But for my science fiction, there's always other stories. Like overall, my first series was uh, Galactic Council Realm. The encompassing story there is the prodigal son returns. It's not, but it's not the prodigal son, it's the prodigal empress that was exiled and actually descendants of the exile. But you don't know any of that because the character story doesn't touch on that until you get into the second book or so like that. Speaking of the Galactic Council realm, uh, that was your that was your first series, correct? That was the first series, yeah. Yeah, and again, just beautiful, beautiful covers on those. You went from advertising to writing sci-fi, basically. Yeah. Yes. How did that leap happen? I, I have I have three rules, and my three rules are this. It must be science before it's fiction. 
It must be history before it's story, and the action must be choreographed. So my love of science, and you take the science and then you expand it. Uh, I knew I had a big story. I had worked on that story for a lot of years, the, the overall big story encompassing. And I wanted to build a character that goes within that universe, but I had a problem. I knew as a first time author, as a new author, I would want to put everything into that book as soon as I just, just cram it full of stuff, which is boring for the reader. Great for the writer. Yes, I got it all in there, but for the reader, no. So I wrote it first person and the first person you are limited on what that character can see and things roll out in front of that character. The story is he's the oldest uh, ensign in the Navy. He messes up as a Marine and they send him to flight school because he showed some talent uh, at the controls of a, of a ship. So they send him to flight school, so it's the oldest ensign there. And during training, he goes, they, go, they start out going, hey, Pop, give me this, pat me. After a while, he does well on jet, so they call him J-Pop. I personally, I wanted to have a dynamic, hard-hitting, really tough guy handle for my pilot. Nah, he's J-pop. <laughs> if you're writing the books and you let the characters define who they are, why they are, what they are, you get things like that. And I've had people question me, go, that's not very dynamic call sign for a hero. Like, it's J-pop. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it, uh, the expositional info dumps are a huge stumbling ground for new writers. Um, and I've never heard the advice, you know, try it in first person that will automatically limit you. Did you come up with that just on your own or did you do training I've, before you started this? No, or? I've always, I've always been a re reader. I've read my whole life. I just, my father was in the air force. We traveled a lot and, uh, he was actually in charge of closing down bases after world war II. So we traveled to Spanish Prince Morocco, traveled to Rome, Italy. Uh, all over the United States, Panama Canal Zone. Um, so I grew up without a lot of friends or family around. So my friends were books. Well, I knew if I had an author I liked, even if I was in Italy or if I was in South Carolina or Washington State, wherever my father was stationed, my friend was that author that wrote that book. I knew that I could trust them to be there for me even if all my other friends were gone. So you just took books as kind of your, your training and your advice yeah. when you started doing this. And, and writing one minute, <laughs> one minute <laughs> stories for years and years and years. So. Was it hard to make that leap from those little tiny stories, those little, almost like flash fiction stories, we could call them to yeah. a longer format. For me, it wasn't because, um, and I've heard authors say, describe their, their style as I, I see a movie and I record the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a gamer. I love RPG games, love gaming. If I had my druthers, I would sit on my couch. I put my Xbox on. I put my dog up on my lap and we would sit there for days on end just playing video games and never write another book. So for me, I picture myself in the, in the scene, looking around picking and choosing what to report, what my characters say, what the dialogue is, what the scene is. Um, I, I, I like fairly sparse scenery. I don't care about describing things that aren't important uh, enough for me. And, and the thing is, readers already have in their head. If you say they walked into a room and there was a rough wooden table and a tankard of, of, of uh, wine on the table and a candle, you're done. Your readers know what they're looking at. They know what they, they know what they see. So uh, that's my style is to put myself in the scene. So the one minute ones that I wrote, I put myself into the shops or the advertiser that I was working with or into the mind of the uh, customer and try to find things to connect. And, and I still do the same thing. I'm in the scene with my characters looking around. My wife has come into my writing room, which is not very big as you can see, and found me upside down with my legs against the wall uh, and a stick pushing on my neck. And she's going to go, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to figure out how Hilario is going to get out from being <laughs> She just threw her hands up and walked away. So she's like, ah, it's him. <laughs> the life of a writer.
Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you need to, I need to feel if, if I'm not excited when my character's excited, if I'm not sad when my characters are sad, if I'm not happy, my characters are happy, then why am I writing? And, and, uh, knock on wood, I've got readers all over the world that like me that I do that. As we said, uh, the Galactic Council realm, that was your first series um, mm -hmm. and your first uh, first book um, overall. Yeah. Uh, so did you do anything special in terms of marketing this book when you put it out there or? No, no. Nope. nothing. I, I, again, hobby. It was to me, it was a hobby. It was, uh, I had some friends I talked to, uh, you, you've talked to Tom Keller, yes. Tom Keller. I met him. He was doing, uh, he was a private investigator at the time. He was a retired police officer, police detective, I guess. And, uh, I was working for a, a, a marketing company and I met him at a, a conference and I said, and, it, and I said something, his friend said, Hey, he just wrote a book. And I said, how do you write a book? He said, just do it. And when you write the book, don't be afraid of it. And that was the best piece of advice he gave me was write the book. Don't be afraid of it. Cause so many people, you go to writers groups and you talk to people that have never released their books cause they're afraid of it. They go like, I've written this book, but I'm not sure if it's done. No book is ever done. I could tell you right now, I could go back and redo everything in my books if I had the chance, but at some point it's done. It's enough. The other thing too, is this, you write as you, and I've read some of your stuff and your stuff's really fun. And I tell when you, when you write something that came out really just came flowed from your soul, you wrote it and flowed from your soul and, and, and you were smart enough not to over edit it. And that's one of the problems I see a lot of times people, there's so many editing programs, there's Grammarly. There's pronoun, there's, I, I can't name them all. And there's, and people will get these programs and they'll run their stories through them. And what this, those, those programs are designed for standard business language. And your writing has an edge to it, has emotion, has, yeah, maybe a wrong word, but maybe a word that takes people to a different place. And, and that's what you try to do. That's what you do in your writing. That's what I try to do in my writing. So if you run it through too many editing programs or too many focus groups or, you know, critique groups, you take that edge off. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the challenges I see people go through. They, they throw out their soul to make it perfect. And, and perfect, we know, is the enemy of production. What are they going to remember about your books? Is it going to be a, a high, a peak, or a low that they're going to think back on your book and go, yeah, whoa, that was, that was phenomenal. And I, at least I hope they see that in my books. Um, and that's what I go for. So some of the rough stuff, some of the rougher spots I'd leave in because I want people to be emotionally involved in what I'm doing. I'm emotionally involved in it. Come on in and see if you are too. Do you have people that you run your work by before? I do. Oh, definitely. You have to, you must. <clears throat> the, and, and it's this, my first, my first reader and my editor is my wife. Knock on wood, she has a classical education and no interest in writing, uh, which is important. This is the hard part. If you give your work to a writer and they give you back notes, there's a good chance they're going to want to change the way you write to the way they write. And I've seen it in focus groups and I've seen it in people trying to help people. Um, I've got a couple of people I help periodically with their writing and all they get from me is questions. Hey, is this, it, the, or, or this isn't clear or, the, or what does this mean? I don't ever rewrite what they did. I may drop in maybe this word, not that word, but that's it. They don't, I never rewrite passages. But so many writers want to go, oh, I can help you. Let me, <clears throat> and all of a sudden they're writing way off what you, the way you write. Now, on the other side of that, if you have friends that you show your work to and they read it, unless they're in tune to that genre, that could be just as dangerous. They could go, I don't get it. I don't, why did you write that? I don't get it. Well, you don't like science fiction or you don't like historical adventure, you're not going to get it. 
So yeah, it, it, finding the group, I have a knock on wood, I have a couple, couple other people that I run my work by uh, that are science fiction fans or that are historical uh, fans. And, and you have to have that other thing because here's the truth. You as a writer don't know if your work's any good. You just don't. You can do your best. You can write. You can do everything. But in a final analysis, you can't tell. I can't tell. I know I've got a couple scenes that I thought were fabulous. That's a great scene. And I got ripped apart by my, by my readers for it. They went, why did you write that? It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't go anywhere. I went, yeah, it does. It goes from here to there to there. And I had to stop and I would wait. Message sent, message received, right? My job as a writer is not to argue that you're not seeing what I'm writing. My job as a writer is to write it well enough so that you see exactly what I want you to see. And if it's not coming across, it's not your fault. That's my fault. Let's get into the Clay Warrior series a little bit. So that was your second series that you started after- Second series. Galactic, yes. uh, Galactic Council Realm. And as you said, it's based during the first Punic War. To me, anyway, that's a pretty big leap from military sci-fi. People say, well, what do you write? Uh, write what you know. Well, I've never been a space pilot, and I've never been a legionnaire on a combat line uh, in the ancient Roman Empire. I mean, a republic. So I write what you know. No, write what you're curious about. And that's what I do. And I'm curious about science, and I'm curious about history, and, and ancient technology and modern technology. So for me, it all stems from what will I spend hours doing research on? And if I do the research, will I be happy with building a story around it? Um, and, and that's what happened. My first book, um, I studied uh, a lot of... <laughs> And not the big stuff. I mean, you create the, the engines of the spaceships, you create them. But 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 cats and bugs and all of that, you start studying all of that. And how big can a how big can a bug get? You know? <laughs> it's just like it's not gonna get huge. It's not, you know, but it's gonna get the size of a medium-sized dog. If you get a spider the size of a medium-sized dog, that's a pretty vicious beast. Mm -hmm. uh, and you better have a space cat with long claws to take care of that. And, and here's the other thing. How would how would a dog do on a spaceship? Right? But a cat climbing deck to deck, not a problem. So you have a lot of research and research on weapons as well. Research on, on, on guns and what type of, of ammunition they use in space. Would you want to use a ballistic uh, round that goes through the hull? You know, no, you don't want it to go. You want to hit the hole and splatter and stop because if it goes through the hole, there goes your atmosphere. So that's part of that because in the research there. Ancient history, of course, is the study of ancient history, but then the technology, the, the, the grinding wheel, that's how they made steel. Is it very difficult, like different styles that you write with when you're writing historical fiction versus military sci-fi? In a sense that you actually have to spend more time explaining uh, technology. For instance, uh, my third series, bring my hands up, my hands are, my hands are all working down here really hard, <laughs> but you can't see them. Uh, my third series is Call Sign Warlock. And it's a, a, about a, a, a space Marine who is in charge of uh, striker units. And striker units are uh, corridor assault groups. So when the Marines go on to, to, fight pirates or whoever on a on a spaceship they get bogged down because they got corridors they got people shooting down the corridors and you can't run well she's in charge of a five she's a, a four-person team their job is to go down that court attack down that court she goes on another mission and she gets the mission goes bad really bad she's crossing back over to a rescue ship and ends up holding the, her shuttle against the ship, standing in the flow of ions, getting everybody else to safety because that's the kind of hero she is. While she's doing that, her eye, her face shield cracks and her eye gets muted, mutated. So they're gonna, she's gonna lose the eye, but all of that big optic nerve is sucking down information, wants more information. So they put a bionic eye in her. Now, at this point, I've done a lot of research on the human eye. As a matter of fact, she ends up with one, two, three, four, five, six different powers in that eye. 
My other one she, I like is she has a Heller's organ. The Heller's organ is uh, a thing, a ticks have that. So, you know, if you go into the woods, you know, the, you think, well, how did the ticks know you're there, right? It's not like they, they can't jump. They don't even crawl fast, right? Ticks have a Heller's organ and make sure I get this right. They can detect exhaled carbon dioxide from your breath and they can detect, detect ammonia in your sweat. So she has the ability to sit across from you and smell if you're nervous, if you're tense, if you're nervous or you're tense and she's questioning you, she can detect the carbon dioxide in your breath and ammonia in your sweat with that eye. So she becomes like a human lie detector. Then she's got a sidekick that is just a piece of garbage. Uh, <laughs> his name is Poet and he's her, he's her pilot and her researcher. So one of the challenges is if you've got a hero that's out front taking care of things, who's feeding that pilot, who's feeding that hero information? Well, she has Poet. Poet is kind of her mirror image. Poet is, I don't know if you know anybody like this, but when they're, when they're working a project, they're on point, and they're doing it, they're great. But as soon as that project's over, they just fall apart. They're, they're listless. They may do drugs. They may drink. They all the, all the sins in the world because they're not on point. Mm -hmm. And once they're back on point, they're fine. Well, poets like that. And again, when I'm, when poet and warlock are talking, I'm in the room with them. I'm watching them. That series that's tied into the galactic council realm series. It, right? it is a spinoff. Warlock is a spinoff of the galactic council realm. Right. She's written in third person. Right. Mm -hmm. She's not first person because it was too hard to get all of that uh, and all the stuff that was going on around her. And and she actually is where where J pop is out fighting in space. Warlock spends most of her time planet side. And and uh, the big overall the big overall thing for her is is this. She's taking combat techniques she's taking them to the world of espionage and and traitors and espionage and traitors are working behind the scenes they're not blatant on what they're doing so it takes more investigation to identify the bad guy whereas j-pop he's got machine guns and, <laughs> and and fighters and bombers and just just craziness going on she was the first uh female lead character that you had is that true yeah Oh yeah, series? I pulled some from some very dynamic women that I work with over the years. Um, so yeah, so she's pretty much a, if you know anything about uh, like she's a straight razor tote woman. So she, <laughs> you don't give she don't give warlock any any problem because she will feed it right back to you in spades. So yeah, she's a she's I love her, love that character, love her die, love doing her dialogue uh, mm -hmm. because she just she just did. Uh, She's, she's nuts. Love her. <laughs> All my characters are nuts. Because I am too. And they're adventure books. I mean, they're made to, I try to put, something else I do in my books. My books are written two ways. One is the overall story and the characters and dialogue, sparse, quick, moving along, pop, 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 pop. If you just want to grab it and you get into a little, uh, the uh, reader types, you've got, you've got the reader types that read slow and steady and read every word and every sentence and they're looking for mistakes. <laughs> they're gonna find them. Uh, then there's the people that read it kind of in the middle. And and if you're, if you're doing Amazon, like I do Kindle and Kindle Unlimited, the Kindle readers are reading a little slower, they're reading along. The Kindle Unlimited readers are reading fast they want give me the story give me the action sequences here we go let's roll 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 let's go i want it over next scene next scene and and done and you can read the books that way if you're the other reader and you start reading you're going to notice detail in the last series you write or the most recent series you've started writing uh terror and talons i think is the first book that's uh yeah hawks hawks of the sorcerer queen it's the terror and talons Taryn Talons, and I love, that's my favorite cover. That cover is really great. I always wondered about heroes in uh, epic fantasy stories. And and the heroes in epic fantasies are always like, well, they're kids, or they, they don't know they have the special talent. And and I like that. I had no problem with it at all. But 
then I thought, well, levied troops in a siege, especially in Middle Ages, they weren't taught to be warriors. They they kind of OJT on the job training. So that's what I have. I have have a guy that's a sergeant of of uh, of uh, levy troops. They really don't know what they're doing. He's learned everything he can from watching the knights and uh, the men at arms that work specifically for dukes and and for the you know the lords. So he he's just kind of there. And then there's some magic and all that. So that was that was I thought that would be fun to do to write a a kind of a medieval um, with magic. And I've never written magic. I've always stayed away from magic because to me the magic is the human spirit. The magic is how we use even technology, whether it's a a, a bolt thrower from ancient Rome to a a weapon that shoots a, a round that splats. That could splat against the uh, the hull of a ship, and then of course I had to have a a mysterious princess that they didn't know was the princess. I mean that's kind of there's a lot of tropes in there, but it was fun to write. But the truth is, what I do I do this for a living now. This is how I make my money, and Black Council Realm was my second best selling series. Call Snow Warlocks my third. Uh, Hawks of the Saucer Queen and Terrors and Talons that's my third. But my my money maker is the uh, Clay Warriors. That has the most readers. I have readers all around the world. There's a scary part of that, and that is this. If you start writing a series, like people talk about write the market, like study a market, figure out what the tropes are, do all the stuff, write that book, okay? And people will buy it because it's exactly what they're looking for. Make sure the cover matches, all of that. So you've got this really great thing. Now, suppose you don't really love that genre. But you wrote a hit book. What do you do? Write another one, another one. By the third one, fourth one, you've already you, what you've done is you've created a job you don't like for yourself. So I, I always warn people: if you're going to write something, make sure you like it, so you don't become a slave to it. You don't become up. Well, it's time to go to work. It's Monday morning. I think I'll have a heart attack because I have to go create another one of those books when I really rather write something else. That sounds like maybe, maybe one of my worst nightmares is creating, like wanting to be a writer so badly that you create a job you don't want. Like that's yes. not what writing is supposed to be at all. Yeah. Well, I often wonder about character actors that study Shakespeare and they study great acting in school and then they get on a soap opera, right? <laughs> so they're making good money and they're going to work every day and I'd love to talk to a soap opera star and ask them how they feel about that. Is to them, is that satisfying acting? Now I realize some of them when they're on break go do summer theater uh, mm -hmm. to get their to keep their acting chops up. But again, you're going to that same job every day and you're reading the lines and you're acting, yes. But is it the acting that you wanted to do? Clay Warrior stories, I just released book 16. There's still six years left in the first Punic War. I can't, I can't not write that one. And, and worse than that, not worse, but I did a, uh, I sent my cover artist to lady who does my covers, Elizabeth McKay. I asked her to do me a, uh, a cover. Cause I was thinking I'm going to do a Viking in space and just to throw away just crazy Viking in space and fighting. And she sends me, can I do this? Oh, it's not going to come out. You can't see it. Yeah, Darn not it. quite. Yeah, it's not clear. But it's a dragon. It's oh, yeah. a, a Viking on a ship. It's called the Cursed Viking, a star Norseman. I want to write that now. So I can't do a throwaway book because it's too good a cover. So that's a fifth series then in your in your bibliography possibly coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, again, I wanted to do Viking in space, but the covers, the cover I like so much, I said, I can't do that. I'm gonna have to write a real book. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe a new series. My favorite writer, Bernard Cornwell, they ask him about research and he says he probably uses maybe 5% of his research that he does. And I do that too. I, I do a lot more research than gets into the books. If it's not part of the story, if it doesn't add to what's going on, you leave it out. And, and it's hard sometimes. It's hard. I know all this stuff and I can explain it 
if I explain it, you won't be confused and I'll ex over explain it. No. Sacrifice to the story. Everything is sacrificed to the story. There is one topic that we need to talk about now. You don't write about Las Vegas. You're writing in space or you're writing in history, but you do live here. Yes. Um, so how did you come to Las Vegas? in the first place we i met i met my wife we got married in baltimore i was uh, working for i got out of the marine corps i went to the university of maryland and i got a job in radio working in uh, uh in baltimore and it was very good for me i did very well but i hit a point in my career where my i had a uh, one of my managers described it as the corporate uh uh in your vet the corporate drug of money in your veins and it says you treat people badly because you need them to do a job and produce. No matter if it hurts them, no matter what you have to say to them, you drive your people to do it. And if they complain, you throw them away and you get somebody new and you coach your best people and you let the other ones fade away because you need to make the money, make the dollars, pull it in. And I hit a point in my career where I had to make that decision. I was going home at night looking at my wife going, I am not a happy man. I need to get away from here. And I said, I said, we need to move. Where do you want to go, baby? My wife said, I want to go anywhere where my hair doesn't frizz because of the humidity and I never have to drive on ice again. I said, sounds like uh, Phoenix to me. So I flew to Phoenix. I interviewed at radio stations there. I flew to Las Vegas, interviewed Las Vegas. This was 2000 and I'm looking around at Las Vegas and it's all new construction. It's new businesses. It's a boom town. And for somebody that works in advertising, it's a gold mine. So that's how I end up in Las Vegas. Um, knock on wood. Um, have you heard of 20 books to 50 K? I have heard of it. Yeah. Okay. Which is a, a web thing. Excuse me. My allergies are just destroying me. Uh, they have their yearly conference here in Las Vegas, right. which is the largest independent author convention in the world. And that's kind of a cool thing to be here. It's funny about groups like that. Um, there's pros and cons. Uh, the pro is you really will find out quickly that you're not alone in this business. Because that's one of the challenges when you're sitting at home as a writer and you go, nobody else understands what I'm going through. <laughs> you go, <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, there are lots. I also have a number of friends that are writers that we talk once in a while. Uh, and it's always good for somebody else to bounce things off of because, and this is the weird part, uh, if your writer friend says, hey, I've got this character that's doing X and I need them and I need them to move forward and I don't know how to get solve this situation. You may say, well, how about this? Or how about that? You give them choices, right? And then later when you're working on your own stuff, because you've used that to unblock your creativity, you come up with solutions for your own stuff because you've opened your mind to new possibilities. It sounds like you're not really in like any writer groups here, um, like Henderson writers or anything like that. I, I'm not, I have, and I've always had an issue with joining things. I joined, <coughs> let me take that back. I joined something when I was 18 years old and it turned out to be the United States Marine Corps. And they sent me to, on a, they sent me on a vacation to the Far East. And they said, here's the rifle, here's an enemy, go hunt. And for 18 months, I was somebody different than me. I'm a very caring, very loving person. I will go out of my way to help people I know. Uh, I'll give of my time, I'll give of myself, I do it. I had to become something completely different to make it through war. Mm -hmm. And I never want that guy to come back again. Not good, <laughs> not, right. not yeah. a good look on me, okay? But I was really good at it. Uh, I got a Purple Heart, I had uh, 13 combat operations. And the truth of the matter was, it was something I wanted to do. It was volunteer. I wanted to be with the best. I wanted to challenge myself. And the United States Marine Corps certainly gave me the challenges that I needed. But uh, yeah, I'm not a joiner and I don't have time. Uh, this morning I was writing ad copy for my Amazon ads. Uh, this afternoon I have to format my book to get it up on uh, to Amazon. 
And then I have to contact, once I know the, how many pages, I have to contact my cover artist to send me the uh, paperback cover. This is the really great paying hobby or really hard job that pays good. Mm -hmm. So when you're an indie like me, you, you do it all. I've talked to a number of writers um, and most of them are in groups. Um, but I think it is something worth noting that like when you join a group, it's not about like what you get out of it, like taking away, you have to give to it too. And that is a time commitment. Um, so you do have to make sure that you have time for that sort of thing, or it's going to be unpleasant for both you and I think the group as well. Yeah. And it becomes a chore. I mean, it's, it sounds mercenary, but it kind of is, if you're going to be a writer, you have to put the product out there for your fans. Right. And I think it's just reality too. I mean, if you're going to be a writer, you have to, you know, have something that you have written that is out there. So if you were to meet a writer that had either recently moved here or was considering moving here, specifically a writer moving to Las Vegas, what kind of advice would you give them about like being successful here or getting involved with writing? I, I would not discount writers groups because they do have situations where you can join a writer's group and find out about other stuff going on. Maybe uh, the ability to go to a library and, and sell your books or present your books. Um, there are good stuff in, in the writer's groups. And in sales, we had an expression. It was called just like work. So you say, well, I'm Excuse me. I'm going to a writer's group. It's just like work. Uh, I'm outlining a book. It's just like work. I'm doing research. It's just like work. I'm thinking about my book. It's just like work. The truth is none of those are producing your product for your reader. Yet they all feed into it. They're all necessary. But if you spend too much time doing all of those and not actually writing, it's just like work. The actual work is sitting down and putting one word in front of the other, creating paragraphs, sentences, paragraphs, creating scenes, creating chapters, creating a whole story that goes from one end to the book to the other. And and so when you start, yes, you should. I, I went to a number of meetings for a number of groups for a while and enjoyed them and it was fun. But after a while, I realized that people were not producing, they were doing just like work and a lot of those after a while. But I did pick up two or three very close friends that I stay in contact with that are my support group when I'm crashing as a writer. So yeah, if you're moving to Las Vegas, there are a lot of writer groups. There's a lot, there's, there's amazing enough, there's a lot of history here. Uh, and so writing history research. There's some like, great technical places here. We have the, the nuclear test facility. Oh, the atomic uh, testing museum. Yeah, and yeah, the museum. Oh, fabulous, fabulous research. And not just for Cold War, but for science fiction. We have geographical formations close by. You have the Grand Canyon not far from here. You have Red Rock right up the road. All of that is fodder for ideas and dreaming and taking, you know, what, what does the moonscape look like? Go out to Red Rock. You don't know what, Mar like on Mars, go out there. Maybe you're going to write the next Martian, which would be fun. So yeah, that's, that's the, what I like about Las Vegas is all the different things. You have the old West towns, cowboys, you have, uh, you know, of course you have all the casino stuff, you know, Paul Papa writes the, the casino and old, old hard, core Vegas stuff. Yep. Uh, and he does it well. There's so much richness here that if you need inspiration, it's it's definitely in this place. And yep. if you need support, there's so many writers here, you're going to find your, find, call it your tribe, people you, you, you identify with that you can share uh, ideas, you can brainstorm with, grab a coffee, grab lunch, sh just spend an hour just talking about books and yep. story ideas which is a great way to do it too. I'm very happy I moved here. <laughs> so. Where can people reach you or keep up to date with your uh, new stuff coming out? My website, which is jcliftonslater.com. Uh, all my books there, you can link from there to Amazon, uh, no matter what country you're in, because we have a feeling this, this video is going to go international, if I have anything to say about it. And I 
will answer emails. I do, good or bad. If you want to trash me, then I'll try to give you a reason. If not, then I'll apologize. Um, and if you like my books, that's good to know too. Uh, and those are the two main things. I always tell people you can always go to Amazon and look for Jay Clifton Slater or Clay Warrior Stories or Galactic Council Realm, uh, Taryn Talons or um, uh, Call Sign Warlock. Do you do like a newsletter or anything like that? I do a newsletter. Okay. I do. Uh, sign up sheet is on my, and I got to admit, I'm bad at it. Uh, I, I do. I need to get one out about the new book. Uh, yeah, I send them out. Uh, I try to do once a month. Uh, and those are on my website. You can sign up there. I also do blogs about ancient history. I have so much research that it doesn't get into the book. So I do blogs on ancient history. Finally, uh, what is next for you? You kind of mentioned that you're doing the next Clay Warrior book right now. Uh, actually, what's next is a science fiction and a short story for science fiction anthology. Uh, I, it, a lot of anthologies work this way. You send them the first 500 words for a story. If they like it where you're going, they like what you write, like what you're doing, they say, okay, good, you're in. Uh, write the next six to 8,000 words. So I've got a notice up on my wall. Uh, write the next six to 8,000 words. And then they run it by their proofreaders. They run it by their beta readers. And if they like it, you're in the anthology. So I got my first 500 words in. Uh, they liked it. So that's next is to write that. Hey, yeah. this has been fun here on the Neon Salon or Neon Saloon or whatever Neon it is. Salon. Salon. Yep. <laughs> Neon Salon. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and thanks everyone for watching. And we'll see you next time. 